Once you have sniffed academic air, you can never go away from that. So I certainly would do it again. I always say I'm basically a clinician who does research. And that has a reason. For me, a researcher is entirely dependent on the university. He has no way left or right or up and down. He needs to follow the road in the university. He has to get funded from the university, which the university normally doesn't. So he has to get his own funds through foundations, through uh, industry, or where, where are you, you know. And he's continuously spending half of his time, that's probably too much, but a, a third of his time in writing grants and grant reports. So his effective time for doing research is limited to probably two-thirds, three-quarters. Now, the researcher is a highly specialized person that normally is dealing with not only a field, but a little detail in the field. He becomes a specialist of a certain pathway in pathogenesis and knows everything about that. For me, this is not enough, never was enough. I have, I'm a man of many interests, and so I am in science. I like to look at things from different angles. So I like to have the freedom to do research when I get the question, to ask this question, answer it, and for the moment being, becoming in depth there but then also looking at it from another end and maybe also completely switch gear. You have mentioned before that I had various things I was pursuing in my career. And this is very typical because I, I probably don't have the perseverance to look at how a T cell says good morning to a B cell. That does not mean that I downgrade that research, quite the opposite. I can be very enthusiastic about that kind of research, but it is not my life. My life has initially been uh, to be a clinician, and that's why I became a dentist. I, my father used to say the dentist is the last academic artist there is. And he had a certain point to that. You know, a dentist has to have skills. He cannot have two left hands and five thumble fingers on each. He needs to be skilled. Plus, he needs to know his way around the customers, the patients. He needs to be able to get into the personal life if necessary, to listen to patients, and he needs to like that. If you don't like, if you don't love your patients, keep your hands off. You need to really take it as an experience every time you treat patients. And when I treated patients during my active time in Bern, I was 30% of the time, three half days a week. In Hong Kong, it boiled down to a half a day per week. And now that is over. And I really miss that occasionally. But I have also the advantage of not being available any minute anymore. But I would say being a clinician is the key thing. But then that was not enough either. I needed to be inquisitive. I needed to be analytic and I needed to do experiments. 
It, it was just an urge all of my life. And you're asking, how is that? Well, occasionally it is phenomenal and occasionally it is very frustrating. Research as a whole is not just a blue sky. And it has a lot of uh, stones in the way, a lot of inhibitions and a lot of uh, problems to, be, to overcome. But by and large, research is very exciting. There is a tension all the time. And I remember every time when something is finished and you're going to look at results or a graduate student brings you the results, this is always a moment of enormous excitement and you're thinking, what does it mean and so on. But you have to like that. And I was a person who could not write, not at all. I hated writing in school. Styles were a horror for me. And when I got my first article into Harald Lohr's office, it came back not in blue, but in red, as if I didn't write, write it. He corrected so much. And that first article, there were 14 versions until the paper was submitted. And I thought, well, heaven's sake, why all of that? And today I do the same thing with other people. And I have great fun in writing. I love writing discussions, which was a, a nightmare before. But slowly but surely this came. It's practice. And fortunately, the last 30 years, it has been like that. It is a tremendously exciting life. And one other thing which is very exciting, as opposed to a clinician at home, the clinician at home is a master of his office. He has three, four, five employees, and what he says is done. No problems asked. But he has problems in recruiting people when somebody is pregnant all of a sudden. He has personal problems. So did I as a chairman of a department. I am bound to, by, you know, administrative uh, issues, red tape as we call it. I cannot always do what I want and I have to keep budgets. So these are negative things. But it's part of the fun to have these restrictions and yet get done what you want to do. Squeeze out funds there to do this study there. So this is like a managerial job that is, uh, offers a lot of variety that I haven't learned. I learned it on the job. I had to learn it on the job. The last thing which is so exciting for uh, a researcher is the discussion with fellow researchers. And these are mostly clinicians. They may be in the practice and not do research, but once upon a time may have done research. Or they may be your colleagues, really, in other parts of the world. These friendships you cannot pay for. They are enormously important to me and have given me so much in my life that I can go almost anywhere in the world. And I have friends. You feel you have friends. You can discuss things. You also have sometimes odd guys, yes, who hang on and you'd rather say goodbye to them. But, but uh, by and large, this is the enormous experience as a clinical researcher. Finally, to be a clinical researcher within a faculty is another special position you have. You're part of a university. And when there is graduation and you go in cap and gown, 
it's more than a national uh, crew on a football field, the way you feel. You really feel part of the academic life. That, no practitioner has that. The question why people go into academic life and stay there is very crucial because a lot of people go into academic life but they go out sooner or later and most of the time the reason is money. We are in academic life not paid what we are worth, I must say. And we are not paid near close to what a young researcher should get compared to his colleague in private practice. I take the orthodontists as an example because then I don't offend anybody because everybody knows that. An orthodontist can easily make a half a million Swiss francs a year. An orthodontist at the university will make probably a fifth of that. So it takes a lot of temptation to not go into private practice because they are reputable specialists, they have full satisfaction and they have sometimes families that cost money. While we had to squeeze out the money from here and there, and fortunately I had a father-in-law who once helped me a little bit, these are things that uh, are part of academic life. In Ann Arbor, I was so poor, I had to get my lunch in the Huron Valley National Bank who offered apples for free. So I went there and ate three apples for lunch because we didn't have the money. And, uh, you know, that doesn't do any harm when you look back. I mean, in the end, you live comfortable and you're not poor. And nowhere in the world are you poor as an academic teacher. So you get more or less what you deserve, but it takes a long time. The question of a greatest achievement you can actually measure by going into the citations what is the article that is most often cited? Is that then the greatest achievement? It has certainly a great impact. That was the bleeding on probing issue in 1986 where we realized that that had something to do with uh, progression of lesions and the subsequent articles that showed the opposite, that absence of bleeding showed periodontal stability. I think that had a lot of impact. But the greatest achievements I felt were the last series of studies on osteointegration. Because that really was getting on a turf that nobody had tackled before. And uh, it was deliberately planned to be like that. So right now, I don't know whether it's the novelty still and that the articles came out in 2011 that uh, are overwhelming to me. But I think that is a very, very good um, achievement. And then I have numerous good achievements that I have actually have to give credit to my co-workers. I mean, we were a very good team in Bern. We were a good team with experts in different fields. I may mention Andrea Mombelli, who is in Geneva today. Andrea has a phenomenal curriculum. And a lot of the studies he did uh, were significant studies, good contribution, pioneer work. He just recently uh, saw a list that the number 23 
of the dental literature is a study with him as a co-author on implant microbiology. So these were things we did without uh, following the stream. And uh, if you have people who then establish themselves, that is just fantastic. I always gave the senior authorship to my co-workers. So you don't find too many articles with me as a first name. When I'm first name, I have really done most of it. But otherwise, uh, I gave, like with Mombelli, with Bracker, with Hammerle, they have their series of articles where they built up their reputation. But of course, all these studies were done in uh, a consensus and in a trend that we had within the department. And that was part of the excitement of being a chairman all these years. I sometimes felt like a football coach, or let's say better probably a conductor of an orchestra, where I had certain instruments like the wind wood instruments who could play on their own in a little serenade, but also the whole orchestra could play symphony. And believe it or not, we only played symphony twice. Only twice could I get the full manpower of the department together to come with a series of studies on the same topic where all the expertise was in, only twice. So that shows you that when you, when you promote young academicians, they sometimes go their own way quite early. And to have everybody online is very difficult. I have more than one. In my office, you always had three pictures. One was Harald Lö as a role model, as a mentor. So was Sig Ramfjord. And the third one I had is the one I respect really the highest, is Sture Neumann, who passed away, uh, I think, 10 years ago. From Sture Neumann, I have learned to think perio, but also to go against established principles in restorative dentistry. He really thought biologically. And uh, his discussions with him were unbelievable. I had him for two years in Bern. After he retired, at age uh, 68, he came to Bern until he was 70 or 71. And we spent so much time together. We wrote together. This was unique. So these are the three professional heroes, and I may add a living one. And that is Jan Linde. I cannot help uh, saying that Jan Linde, who is seven years older than me, he has not been my mentor. Uh, but I spent a sabbatical in the year 2000, and then I realized his character and his genius and we became very, very close friends. Today we are very close friends. So these are the professional heroes, if I may say so.